loving Heavenly Father. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin so that we can be in relationship with you, that we can become your family. We just ask you that you will just teach us something new about yourself today as we hear from um, your word, as we continue to worship you in other ways. Will you just awaken us 
to some new truths about who you are and about who we are in you. We pray all these things in your precious son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Liz Lindsay, and thank you, Praise Team. And uh, good morning, Gateway. And uh, welcome, everybody, to the second service in a series that we're calling Summer in the Psalms. We saw last week that the Psalms are ancient Israel's hymn book. And uh, these are the songs that shaped Jesus, his disciples, and the early church. It's our hope that this series is going to feel a little bit like the summer music festival that we en as we enjoy some of the songs that Jesus loved. L we noticed last week that the songs that we sing are a little bit more like spectacles that we look through than something that we look at. In other words, our worldview is really, really shaped by the music that we love. And if this is true, then the Psalms are like the eyeglasses that Jesus looked through. And when we, put, when we read the Psalms, it's like putting on the glasses that Jesus wore to see the world. Last week, we looked at Psalm 46. This is a psalm that Jesus spoke when he, um, he quoted from this psalm when he spoke to the wind and the waves and the storm. And he said, be still. And this is something that Jesus would often do, is that he would quote part of a, a Bible verse from the Old Testament, and he would expect his listeners to complete that verse in their minds. So when he uh, quoted Psalm 46 and said to the storm, be still, he knew that the disciples would finish the verse in their mind. This is a song that they all know really, really well. And they would realize, maybe a little bit later after thinking about it, that Jesus was saying, be still and know that I am God. And we saw last Sunday how by the Spirit who is in us now, Jesus speaks the same word, be still, to our hearts today. Okay, today we're going to look at another psalm that has a, had a profound impact on my personal life. Psalm 139. We're going to begin by reading verses 1 to 6. And uh, so we're going to put on Jesus' glasses together. Turn there in the Bibles that you have in front of you to Psalm 139. And sorry, 139 rather, not 136. And here's how it goes. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Okay, we're going to just stop there for now. Not long ago, the Globe and Mail posted an article about an experiment that some Dutch researchers did about 25 years ago. So they asked these volunteers to endure electric shocks while their respiration and their perspiration rates were monitored to measure the physical signs of their anxiety. Now, I, I'm not sure why you would, would volunteer for such an experiment. I don't know if some people maybe just don't have enough pain in their lives. But the volunteers were split up into two groups, okay? The first group was told, you're going to receive 20 strong electric shocks in a row. The second group was luckier. They would receive 17 very mild electric shocks with three of those strong shocks interspersed randomly. So who do you think suffered more? Which group would you like to be part of, you know? The first group with the 20 strong shocks in a row or the second group with 17 mild shocks with only three random strong ones? Well, measured in amps, the first group obviously got the worst of it. No surprise there. But measured in racing heartbeats and anxiety levels, measured in actual pain levels, it was the second group who clearly suffered much more. How could this be? The researchers discovered that it was the uncertainty of not knowing what was coming or when it would come, was a much worse pain than the pain itself. And so we see from this experiment that, I'll put it this way, monsters 
are scary. But not knowing if there's a monster out there or when it will attack is even scarier. And I suspect that's why this psalm is so universally loved. The psalm talks about certain aspects of God's character that give suffering people comfort and hope in uncertain times. And the first thing that the psalmist sings about is God's omniscience, which is just a fancy word to say that God is all-knowing. He knows everything. God knows stuff that you don't know. This, my friends, is a fundamental fact of reality, and you've got to accept it. You've got to process that if you're going to deal with anxiety and fear. Because the, the deal is this. Monsters are out there. And I know you told your kids that monsters aren't real. And I'm not talking about the fictitious monsters that lived un underneath your bed when you were a kid. And that's why you didn't dangle your feet over the edge of the bed at night. I wish I could tell you by comparison that those monsters are real. Because the real monsters in this world are worse. <laughs> Much worse. Disease. Hatred. War. Violence. Pain. Depression. Mental illness, relational breakups, mental trauma, emotional trauma. If you haven't met these monsters yet, don't worry, you will. And the prob problem that causes us so much anxiety is not just the monsters that are out there, but what really messes us up is that we don't know when they're going to attack. We don't know what they're going to look like when they arrive. It's, as far as I can tell, friends, the only way to deal with that kind of uncertainty is to realize that you don't know what's coming and to accept that you can't control it anyhow. And to put your trust then in someone who does know what's coming and who loves you. The psalmist, when he looks at the randomness of this world, can only find peace here when he realizes, I don't know stuff that God knows, and that's okay, because he's in control. He says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. And then keep on reading to check out a laundry list of all the stuff that God knows that you don't. For example, I don't know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. I mean, yeah, I've got a calendar, I've got a plan, but I often, I often have very little control over stuff that just interrupts my schedule. But God, you know when I sit and when I rise. He knows what I'm going to be doing and when. How much control do I really have over what I'm going to be thinking about later on today? I mean, do I know what I'm going to be thinking about, what's going to be going through my mind? No, that's... That's why I have to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. But God, it says, you perceive my thoughts from afar. He knows what I'm going to be thinking about before I think them. Do I have any real knowledge of what's going to come out of my mouth later on today? No. But God, before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. He knows even what I'm going to say. See, the psalmist sings with joy about God's omniscience. Because he realizes, I'm not in control, and that's a good thing. I wouldn't do a very good job if I was. But there's this big God who is in control of my life, my eternity, and I'm going to rest in that. He says, you hem me in before and behind. You lay your hand upon me. I love that imagery. I do that with my kids, you know. I lay my hand on them. God lays his hand on us. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. He's saying, God, you know everything that's coming into my life tomorrow. You know my eternity from front to back. I don't, and you know what? That's a good thing. I can trust that God knows, and that's okay. You know, there's this guy um, that I knew years ago. He, um, he moved from the Philippines to Canada with his wife and his two young sons at the time, and and shortly after that time, he was driving late at night with his youngest son from one place to another, I think in British Columbia. And um, he was just planning to rent a hotel when he got to the city he was going to. And this was the days before cell phones, before online reservations. His son, who I think was about seven years old at the time, he says to his dad, Dad, where are we staying tonight? And the dad says, well, I don't know, at a hotel. And the kid gets really anxious. And he's agitated because he doesn't know stuff. What hotel? Where is it? Am I going to sleep in a bed? What's the bed look like? 
And it sounds like those poor Dutch volunteers who are bracing, you know, for the shock that's coming. And they don't know when or what it's going to look like. Anyhow, this conversation between father and son goes on for a while while they're driving. And finally, the father realizes that he's not really going to be able to explain to his son in a way that he can understand that here in Canada, there are lots of major hotels in every single city you go to. And, and, and he realized that his son didn't need to know all the things he was worried about. What hotel and what his bed's going to be like. What his son needed to know is that his dad knows stuff that he doesn't know. And his dad has the situation in his control. And he knows what he's doing. And so the father said, son, look, it, I can't explain everything to you. But here's what I can promise you. Daddy's got this. Daddy knows stuff you don't know. This is not your problem. And you can leave it with me. And the next minute, his son closed his eyes and went to sleep. <laughs> See, friends, this is something that gives the psalmist something to sing about. It's an important part of the eyewear that we've got to put on if we're going to see the world the way that Jesus sees it. If you're going like this these days and you're bracing yourself for what shock or monster is right around the corner, you need to know, look, not what the monster is. You don't need to know when the monster's coming. What you need to know is that whatever the monster is, God's got it. Because if you've placed your faith in God's son Jesus and you've received by faith the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting, you don't need to know the future because the one who holds the future in his hands has placed his hand upon you. He already knows it. Let's keep reading along. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. What is the psalmist singing about now? Here's another aspect of God's character that gives us comfort and hope. God's omnipresence, which is just a fancy way of saying that God is everywhere. I once heard a speaker say, life is basically a long, bad date with yourself. <laughs> and to be honest with you, you know, I can't think of anything worse than that. I mean, I know myself. I'm not that interesting. And if that's all life is, really, if that's all it is, is just getting to know yourself or be yourself or express yourself, if it's just me got to be me, I can't imagine anything more boring than that. But the psalmist says, that's not what life is like for me. For the person who has a relationship with God through Jesus, friends, life as a follower of his is an exciting journey with the most interesting person who never leaves your side. And if all I have to, do, I don't know, look forward to is learning more about the reality of who I am, I don't know, it sounds dull to me. Because I, like I said, I'm not that interesting. And I suspect that might be why the psalmist is so excited to celebrate that God is always there, always with him, always listening, getting to know him, back and forth, doing life together pretty cool. You know, uh, friends, I don't know if, if, if you've dialed into spiritual th things yet. Um, and look, at, I don't want to overstate my case here. I don't want to, as they say on the other side of the pond, over-egg the pudding on this. But it really is simply remarkable to consider that the God who set the stars in place and the one who invented photosynthesis, he wants to hang out with me. He wants to hang out with you. He wants to be with you in the most meaningful way. From the moment you place your trust in Jesus, my friends, until forever. In the most poetic fashion, the psalmist says, I can't go anywhere to get away from God. And while that fact might sort of freak out some people, it really doesn't scare him. David here, the psalmist says, if I could go up to the sky or even into outer space, or if I could dive down to the bottom of this deepest sea, if I could fly around the world to the farthest side of every sea, the psalmist says, even there, your hand 
will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So, you know, friends, if you're getting sick of the company on what some have called a long, bad date with yourself, take hope in this fact, my friend. God wants to be with you. His presence is only a prayer away for those who have trusted his son, Jesus. And if you're worried that God knows the stuff that you've done and you want to keep that in the dark and you want to hide that from him, there's good news about that too. The good news is, guys, you're worse than you ever dared to admit. <laughs> it's true. Way worse than you ever dared to admit is your sins. But the good news is that you're more loved than you ever dared to dream. Yes, God knows everything that you've ever done, everything you ever wanted to do, everything you ever will do, he knows, and yet he loves you more than you ever thought was even possible. The psalmist King David revels in this understanding that I can't hide from God's penetrating gaze. He writes, if I, I say, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me, the light will become night around me, even the darkness will be, not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You know, there was a sad time in David's life when he tried to hide from the gaze of God. It didn't work. David did something unthinkable, unimaginable. He sexually abused a vulnerable young woman and then had her husband killed. And you know, for a while, I think he thought he got away with it. But God saw everything that he did and God was not pleased. David learned the hard way that you can't hide stuff from God. He's everywhere and he sees everything. And this fact now gives David comfort because nobody... Nobody can be more miserable than the person who's trying to hide stuff from God. Friends, it's important for us to realize that people who are hiding in the dark are experiencing tremendous misery. I've been a pastor long enough to know that nobody gets away with anything. I've been a pastor long enough to know, let me say it again, that nobody gets away with anything. Because the worst punishment of all is living with a secret. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor, people have told me, Pastor, what a relief it was for my sin to be found out. <laughs> I was racked with guilt every single day. And the secret was eating away at my soul, kind of like the volunteers in the Dutch experiment. They never knew when the shock of their secret was going to be exposed. Some of the worst monsters, my friends, are the secrets that lurk within the darkness of our own soul. And this is why we need to know that God is everywhere and he sees everything we don't have to hide. When I was in Ecuador a couple of years ago, teaching at the Ninawachi Bible College, and I hope to get a bunch of you down there sometime soon, Lord willing, um, but there was this indigenous student that I got to know. I'll call him Peter. And Peter had a painful past. Peter told me that he and a bunch of his friends were so depressed a couple of years before this that they made a pact one night that they all, would all kill themselves at the same time. This is some of the stuff that's going on down there and the people that we're ministering to down in Ecuador. So these guys all sat in a circle. I think there were about five of them, and they all had a handgun. They pulled the trigger on, of their gun at the same time. Peter's gun was the only one that jammed. And this kid is sitting covered in the blood of his friends, surrounded by their dead bodies. You know, this is the backdrop of some of these folks that we're ministering to down there in Ecuador. And shortly after this, Peter met some Christians. He became a Christian himself, and he became part of a church, and he found out about this Bible college. And when he expressed interest in becoming a missionary, Peter's church actually gave him, they took up a special offering and gave him some money so that he could go to Bible college. And I met Peter because I was talking about hearing God's voice, and Peter at the time was having a really hard time hearing from God. He was like, you know, God used to be really real to me, but God, it feels like he's left me. And I prayed with Peter, and I talked with Peter through an interpreter, and I tried my best to help him, but he was so discouraged because things were not clicking. And, and I was so sad because I heard later that day that Peter packed his stuff and left the Bible college because he said, God doesn't care about me. He doesn't want to speak to me. And I thought, oh my goodness, what did I do to this kid? I was just so upset. What happened? What was blocking his relationship with the Lord? But a week later, I was home from the trip, and I 
I heard from the director of the Bible college that Peter, they found out later, had a very dark secret. See, he had actually taken the money that the church gave him for Bible college, and he spent it on himself, essentially stealing from them. And he didn't want to admit that. He didn't want to drag that secret out into the light. And so, even though he'd been through some of the worst that life has to throw at anybody, this poor guy left Bible college rather than admit what he had done. This is why he wasn't getting anything from God. He was holding on to a secret, and there's nobody that's more miserable. The psalmist David sings here that darkness is like light to God. He can see it all. He'll help you to bring everything into the light. He can forgive you. He can restore you. All you have to do is trust in him. Because here's the deal, friends. He's not going anywhere. He's omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. Let's move on and discover one last aspect of God's character that can give us hope. And that is God's omnibenevolence, which is just a big fancy theological word to say that God is all loving. Last week as I was getting ready for this message, it caused me to look back on the day when my daughter Emma was born. And we celebrated her birthday two Tuesdays ago. And it was at dinner time that evening that my wife Krista looked at her watch and she remarked that it was almost the exact hour that Emma was born 22 years ago. I remember what a humbling experience it was to hold my baby girl for the first time. I took the first couple of weeks off of work, and when I was holding her at night, I would often sing to her this song, this old chorus, Holy Ground. This is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present, and where he is, is holy. And, um, you know, there's just something about holding a newborn baby and singing that chorus that made God's presence come alive to me. And I would look into the innocent eyes of my little girl, and I would sing, we are standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. And whenever I would sing those words with Emma in my arms, I would think, wow, angels surround us and they're watching us. Jesus is with us. His Spirit's presence is around us. God, wow, is awesome. And speaking of wow, everything was wow when our children were little. You know, every little thing wowed me. Like, you know, I saw Emma's little hand for the first time and I said, wow, she has a hand. I don't know what I expected, but, you know, it was amazing. Or, you know, I saw her foot. I saw her legs. Wow. She's got feet. She's got toenails. Wow. You know, she can cry. Wow. She can suck. Wow. She can mess up her diaper. I got over that a little more, more quickly. But at first, everything she did, wow. But it wasn't just wow. It was wow God. And when Emma was born, I think that the midwives thought we were a little bit nuts because the first thing that we did was we pulled out a little Bible and we read aloud from Psalm 139. I've mentioned here that every one of these psalms we're going to be talking about this summer has had a powerful impact on my life. I think we did this with my son as well. And uh, these words that I'm about to read now for you, Krista and I read them in the hospital room and by doing so we gave our kids back to God. Check out Psalm 139, 13 to 17. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I love that term. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth... Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. This is beautiful. Friends, we have to absorb these words as we're living in difficult days. We have a personal God. He made you. He loves you so very much. He handcrafted you personally in your mother's womb placing tremendous value on your life. And the way that as a parent I feel when I held my little child is just a fraction of the love that God feels when he places his hand upon you, when his right hand holds you on the other side of the sea. 
The last two verses of this section say, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand in the world. One legitimate way to translate this passage is to say, How precious concerning me are your thoughts. And if we understand the verse this way, I suggest it makes more sense of it. David is celebrating how much God thinks about him. Child of God, the number of times that God thinks about you each day are countless. Psalm 139 tells us that we have an omniscient, all-knowing God. He knows the monsters that are around the next corner for you, so you don't have to know everything, and you don't have to worry. Psalm 139 says, we have an omnipresent, everywhere present God. We can live in the light. We don't have to hide because he knows it all anyway. And Psalm 139 says that we have an omnibenevolent, all-loving God. He handcrafted us in the womb. He has a purpose and a plan for our lives. And his thoughts concerning us outnumber the grains of sand in the world. He's a big God. And Psalm 139 says that this omniscient, omnipresent, and omnibenevolent God always welcomes you into his presence. Don't forget it. You know, a pastor I follow on Twitter reminded us of some of the challenges that we're facing these days in the world. (coughs) And he reminded us of where we can turn for help. And I leave you with his beautiful words. Here's what he says. We live in a moment when almost everyone feels weary and worn. Too much has come at us too fast. We're facing at least four crises at once. A public health crisis. An economic crisis. A political crisis. A racial justice crisis. And then we still have to deal with our personal crisis. We are weary and worn. But to the weary and worn, Jesus says... Come to me. The world is harsh, but I am gentle. The age is arrogant, but I am humble. The times are hard, but my yoke is easy. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, it's a habit for us at Gateway to just take a moment to listen to the Spirit of God who now wants to speak to our hearts through the reading and through the exposition of God's word. Psalm 139 encourages this. David ends his song with these beautiful lyrics. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Heavenly Father, would you search us now? Would you test us? Would you point out to us if there's anything offensive in us? If there's any thoughts or beliefs that we need to renounce? If there's any behavior for us to repent of? Lead us, we pray. Speak to our hearts, we ask. We thank you so much and celebrate that you are a big God. And we pray, Lord, that we would live in the light of your glory and your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.
We want to thank you so very much for coming and joining us on this online service. Please do send us an email, a text, or give us a call if there's any way that you think that we can pray for you. We would love to do that. Let me just leave you now, friends, with this word of blessing. May you this week know that a big God has placed his hand upon you as a loving father. And may you feel wherever you go that his right hand is holding you close to him. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.